This is Jim Pruitt, and you listen to another episode of the Farm So Hard podcast. So I farm so hard, the employees wanna find me, and then wanna hire me. What's a hundred k to a guy like me? Could you please remind me? Farm so hard, this ain't easy. Working late nights, you best believe me. My grades can only go ace. Never wanna see another B unless I'm Jay Z. Farm so hard, let's get paid. What's good, fam? Your host Jim Pruitt, aka Farm D and the ED, and I'm bringing you another episode of the Farm So Hard podcast. Today is gonna be one of our shorter episodes. We're going to be having our Pharmacy Friday Pearl. So happy Pharmacy Friday to all of you guys out there. And today we're going to talk about snake bites and particularly talking about the management of snake bites using two agents, Crofab and Anavip. So what we know about snake bites is about 9,000 Americans are treated for them each year and about five of them die and most are bitten by the vipers. Yeah, the pit viper family. And that's going to include copperheads, water moccasins, and rattlesnakes. And there's going to be a huge range of adverse effects that can occur when patients are bit by these. And a good bit of them are going to be local tissue, uh, hematological and it can be systemic, including shock and life-threatening bleeding. When figuring out if we're gonna give the initial dose or additional doses of antivenom, we're gonna use things like swelling beyond one major joint or hematological effects, like decreased fibrinogen, thrombocytopenia, or an increased PT and INR. But the very interesting thing is that patients can develop delayed or recurrent hematological symptoms up to one week after we have finished treatment, especially following a severe envenomation. All right, so let's move into these two agents, Crofab and Anavip. So when looking at Crofab, the mechanism of action is that the Fab fragment of the IgG antibody is isolated from sheep serum, and these antibodies bind to the venom and remove it from the tissue. When looking at the initial dose of Crofab, we're gonna see for progressing tissue or hematological effects, you can start with four to six vials of Crofab. But if you have systemic effects, including shock, you're gonna do eight to 12 vials. And it may be repeated every hour as needed until initial control of local, hematological, and systemic effects are achieved. Once you get there, then you move on to the maintenance. And that's gonna be two vials every six hours times three, and you should be good to go. All my pharmacists out there can attest to the fact that mixing Crofab is a mofo. Uh, It takes forever of gently rolling and swirling in your hand. And then you're going to do that for 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how many vials you're using. And once you are able to reconstitute that with sterile water or normal saline, then you're going to put all that in a normal saline bag of 250 and administer that over one hour. However, you have to watch out for the fact that you can have some infusion related reactions. So you're going to want to slow that bad boy down and drop that infusion rate so the patient can tolerate it. One thing that I talk about that's nerdy that doesn't matter most of the time, but actually do in this particular scenario is the half-life. It's going to be for Crofap 12 to 23 hours. And that's going to make a big difference when we're talking about the other agent, Anavip. And until very recently, it was the only FDA approved agent for the treatment of any North American pit viper envenomation. The other agent that we have is Anavip, and it's going to be Crotalide Immune Fab 2, or Anavip as most of us would call it. And it's going to work by that Fab 2 fragment of the IgG antibody, going to be isolated from a horse serum, and then that antibody itself is going to bind to the venom and remove it from the tissue. The initial dose is gonna be 10 vials, and you may repeat that every hour until you get the initial control of the local, hematological, or systemic symptoms. And after that, there's no scheduled dose like for Crofab, but you may give four vials as needed for any re-emerging symptoms. The reconstitution is gonna be a little easier, and you should be able to reconstitute each vial with 10 ml of NS, and then put that into a 250 bag of saline and administer that over one hour. The half-life is gonna be interesting. It's gonna be 5.5 days, and that's gonna be pretty cool when we start getting into some of the data. And adverse effects are very mild with nausea, arthralgia, and peripheral edema listed in some of the studies, and hypersensitivity reactions can happen with any drug, but 
with these two agents is something that we look at. And if you do have them, you can just dilute the drug a little bit more and slow down the infusion rate. And a very cool thing about Anavip is that until recently, and I'm talking about April 1st, it did not have an FDA indication for some of the other snakes in this family like copperheads. And now Anavip is FDA approved for any North American crotalip envenomation. All right, guys, let's jump into some evidence. One of the first studies that looked at CROFAB was done in 1997 by Dart and colleagues. And it was a randomized controlled trial with only 11 patients. But what they did was look at patients that had minimal or moderate crotalip envenomation. And they used four valves of CROFAB for the initial control of those symptoms. And what they found was that 10 of the 11 patients were deemed to have a clinical response and reduce snake severity score. And some later studies, again, repeated those same results, showing that CROFAB did a phenomenal job in reducing the symptoms of patients that had crotalip envenomation. Now, the controversy is not really there. The controversy comes when talking about using CROFAB or just your FAB, comparing it to Anavip FAB2. In a study done by Boyer and colleagues, it was a phase two randomized controlled trial looking at rattlesnake bites in Arizona. And it was CROFAB versus Anavip. And this was going to be for the reduction in serum venom levels at a various predefined times following crotalib envenomation. And what they found was that venom levels were insignificantly lower following initial control in the crofab group, but significantly lower following maintenance and follow-up in the anavip group. So looking at all that, they also found that there was no major difference in safety outcomes between these patients. So the last study I want to talk about is this Bush and colleagues study that was put out in 2015, which is a RCT at 18 sites in the U.S. It had 123 patients. They looked at the use of CROFAB versus Anavip for the prevention of late coagulopathy following protolib envenomation. And what they found was more patients in the CROFAB group compared to the Anavip group experienced late coagulopathy. It is about 29.7% in the CROFAB group compared to just 10.3% and the uh, Anavip group. And what they found with it, this was statistically significant. It was a number needed to treat a five for this group. Of note, during the original review and approval of Anavip, the FDA made the decision to exclude copperhead patients since late coagulopathy are more commonly observed in the rattlesnake envenomations. And the FDA's focus on rattlesnake data at the time also led to exclusion of copperhead envenomation as the indication for Anavip. This is cool because the original Anavip clinical trial still included copperhead data, which was recently reviewed in a Poxox analysis that looked at two groups of Anavip with that initial 10 valve group with a maintenance therapy after that, a uh, four valves Q6 times three. And it also looked at Anavip with the initial 10 valves by itself plus placebo. And they compared that to Crofab with five valves up front and then two valves Q6 times three. And what they found in those 21 patients that there is no major difference between Anavip and Crofab when looking at time to initial control, patients requiring PRN, or unscheduled doses. And the study concluded that Anavip was non-inferior to Crofab for the treatment of copperhead envenomations. So when looking at all of this, this post hoc analysis and some animal studies showing that Anavip actually neutralized venom from copperhead and cottonmouth and mice and human case report information, this all led to the FDA giving a nod to Anavip for all crotalip envenomations. So get ready for all of, of your PNT committee meetings when it comes to whether you should add Anavip to your formulary, replace it, or have it in combination and use it for just rattlesnake bites. That's gonna be something that really comes to what you and your site is seeing. And the other thing to consider is the cost component because at one period of time, depending on if you need to give additional vows of Anavip compared to Crofab, people were saving like $15,000. So that was going to be a huge, huge, huge cost savings. But the word from the streets is that Crofab realized what's going on and it's going to drop those prices quite a bit. So reach out to your buyers, see what the actual price is, because I've heard from mine that the, the price of Crofab has dropped tremendously. So for me, guys, I can I can be sold on Anavip. Uh, initially, I wasn't when I didn't see that Polk Sox data, but now I'm, I'm kind of on board. And if the pricing benefit is still there, 
I'm pretty good with adding it to a formulary if it's just up to me. My doctor seemed to want it on formulary as well, so I'm gonna go ahead and try to get that pushed forward and let me guys know what you guys are doing. Many people are talking about this right now. Uh, love to hear what you and your shop are doing. But as we close out, don't forget to go over to our sister site, pharmacy-pearls.com, where you can type in pharmacyfriday.com. It's gonna take you to the website. Go ahead and click and subscribe to that email list so you never miss the latest and greatest when it comes to acute care pharmacotherapy. If you haven't already, go ahead and click on that subscribe button in your Spotify and your Apple Podcasts, YouTube, whatever you're listening to this podcast on. Go ahead and give us some support and subscribe to that podcast. Hit me up on Twitter at PharmD underscore in the ED and let me know what you think about this podcast. And you guys know how I end it every single time. Just know, you don't have to be a pharmacist. You don't have to work in the ED, but everything you do makes sure you farm so hard. I the whole ED bounce when we jumped on the scene. Room three is getting crazy. Going on some gem beam and he escalated me. Something to make him dream. But guess what? Got 500 volume ketamine. Nah.